Hi, Chris. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Very well. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you on. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to jump right to it and talk about how when I envision a girl's trip, I think of like straw hats and margaritas and shopping, <laughs> live music, maybe a hangover later. What does a girl's trip look like for you, Chris? <laughs> so um, ours is just a little bit different. A, a girl's <laughs> trip for my sisters and myself, um, it actually involves going to a haunted and historic location. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that we started, um, you know, we all live in different parts of the country. And um, it, we always like to do something unique to, to kind of get together a few times a year, do something a little bit different. And in 2013, we had the opportunity to go to Moundsville, West Virginia, which is where the West Virginia State Penitentiary is located. And this is reported to be one of the most haunted locations in the country. Okay. And we had a, we had a family friend that sat on the board of that facility and he said, you know, while you're here, why don't you stay the night in our in the penitentiary and, and see if you can connect with our resident spirits? And so we've we've always had a fascination with the paranormal. So we jumped at that opportunity. You know, we grabbed some voice recorders, grabbed some uh, cameras and uh, stayed the night in the West Virginia State Penitentiary and and left with that experience, um, really wanting to learn more about the paranormal um, because we had some things that we couldn't explain that night. So did you actually, you slept in a cell, one, just a random cell? Well, honestly, we didn't sleep. Um, we, we got there around, <laughs> uh, you know, we got there around nine o'clock and, um, and we just investigated till probably about three, three thirty in the morning, that first investigation. Um, so when we go to these locations, uh, you know, unless we're there for multiple days, um, a lot of it is spent really investigating, um, you know, asking questions, um, seeing if we can communicate with any of the of the spirits in these locations. Uh, okay. So the first time that you did it, was it an adrenaline thing or um, were you petrified? Oh, it was absolutely an adrenaline thing. Um, you know, you, you had these moments of trepidation when you go into these locations. Obviously, you can't stay the night in a, in a haunted penitentiary and not feel a moment of being startled or something like that. But, right. um, you, you know, for us, it, it was more about the exploration of the location. I mean, what we do is we get to have a very tactile experience with these historical locations, right? I mean, I, I've walked the, the cell blocks of the West Virginia State Penitentiary. I've climbed the stairs of the lighthouse in St. Augustine and, um, you know, stay the night in the Lizzie Borden house. And a oh. lot of people don't get to do that. They don't get to have those experiences. So for us, it's it's really about the historical component. Um, and, and then the paranormal really is secondary when we go to these locations. But, you know, as I said, you do have these moments of being startled of, you know, you hear a door slam or you hear a man's talking uh, when there's no men on the property or in the area. So those are moments when you get startled. But for us, it's more fascinating than anything else. Yeah. You, and you answer my next question. I was going to ask if it was more about history for you or the paranormal. So I guess they go hand in hand, but um, I want to tell everybody your background because a lot of people see <laughs> the, the hokey kind of TV shows, which I watch. And mm -hmm. I know that a lot of it is sensationalized just to get viewers and, you know, they show you just all the good parts. Um, mm -hmm. So I want people to know your background because you're, you're a professional. I am. Yeah. And, and and my sisters are as well. So I have a, uh, my background is in criminal justice. I have a PhD in, in public affairs with an emphasis on criminal justice. My twin sister has the same degree. Um, we have two lawyers on the team and then one um, is a master's holder. So, you know, for us, it, it's not saying that we're better than any other paranormal investigation team out there. We're not saying that by any means. Right. But, but what we do is we come at our investigations with a very open mind. Um, um, we we actually go in with the mindset of debunking. Um, we come at it from a research perspective to really see if we can find environmental factors that would cause somebody to go into a location and say, oh, this is haunted. I've had these experiences. Well, we want to delve in a little bit further to see if we can find, you know, is it a streetlight causing these um, sure. quote unquote apparitions? Or, you know, is there a wind tunnel where if the wind blows through, you hear a mimic of a man's voice or something like that. So the first thing that we do when we go into a location is we actually 
We spend a, a day before our investigation really going through the location and looking for those things that during the night could cause somebody to say it's haunted. Um, as I said before, we look for light pollution, we look for noise pollution, wind pollution, and all of that. Um, so when we go into the location, if we hear something that could be caused by one of those other factors or see something that could be caused by one of those other factors, we have an explanation, a plausible explanation. Right. Um, How come they always um, show it at night? Like, do you see activity during the day when you've gone places? Or oh, ab absolutely. Um, so you know, haunting doesn't occur just at night. The right. reason the reason we primarily investigate at night is for two reasons. One, the first is most of these locations are commercial locations. You know, they have day tours, they have oh, gotcha. daytime activity. Um, you know, it, it, in the case of a library um, or a lighthouse, they have tourists going in and, 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 you know, actually spending the day in these locations. So our only opportunity is at night. The second reason is your senses are much more heightened in the dark, right? You have to rely on things other than sight. So for, like I said, for example, if, if you're in the West Virginia State Penitentiary and all the lights are out and there's very minimal street lights outside, you know, you're relying on hearing, you're relying on touch, you're relying on smell, more so than you are on site. Sure. Also, um, our our equipment is really designed to, to to measure different things, and most of them have light arrays on them, so they they are better at, at night. So, for example, when we use a laser grid, obviously it's easier to see a laser grid at night than it is during the day. Sure. Um. Yeah, that's that's just crazy to me because they always just do show it at night. And it's just that it makes you think that only things like that happen at night. But um, do you prefer going to prisons? Is there more activity in prisons or why so many? Well, well there's different activity in prisons, you know, um, prisons and jails. These are um, locations that one house the worst of the worst in the society. And they also have a range of emotions, right? Um, you know, you have people in there who are murderers or rapists or, um, you know, uh, uh, drug kingpins or something like that. And so there's a, there's a different range of emotions um, that were really imprinted on these buildings. And so for us, you know, the prisons and the, and the, and the jails really do have a different feeling than something like, the Velisca Axe Murder House or the St. Augustine Lighthouse. Um, so they tend to be these locations where you get interesting activity. Um, and so for us, we really do enjoy going to those locations. And in fact, my business partner and I, we actually opened a, uh, a museum and a paranormal research uh, center inside a jail in Huntsville, Tennessee. So, oh. you know, and, and so on a daily basis, we see things and hear things that are, are quite interesting that we can't explain. So for us, you know, jails do have a different meaning and, and, and kind of a special place for sure. Huh. Um, have you ever encountered or interacted with a ghost of somebody that you thought was a famous, like Billy the Kid or, you know, anybody that <laughs> that has a history like that? Uh, not really. Um, you know, we, when you go to these locations, most of them have a, a story, a backstory, a historical story. Uh, so, for example, when you go to um, the uh, Fort Mifflin, right? So that that's a fort in Philadelphia. And you you go in with the mindset of this was a revolutionary war fort. So you you think you're going to interact with you know revolutionary war soldiers sure. or somebody that fought in that in that battle. And and so you kind of go in with that with that expectation. Um I, I'd say probably the most quote unquote infamous person I, I think we've interacted with was at the Lizzie Borden house. And that would have been Andrew Borden, who was, um, who was killed supposedly by Lizzie Borden um, in 1892. That's when the murders happened at the Lizzie Borden house. Mm -hmm. And so we're in that location. Again, we're an all female team. And um, we were talking just amongst ourselves. We weren't really investigating. We were sitting in the parlor where Andrew's body was found uh, again in 1892. And somebody, one of us had made the comment uh, being axed to death would be a horrible way to die. And we captured a man's voice saying it was. Oh. And so, so for us, we're pretty confident that was Andrew Borden. Um, so, uh, you know, we can obviously can't substantiate that per se, because he didn't say this is Andrew Borden. Um, right. But we do believe that, that that was, we're pretty confident that that's who we we're speaking to. Um, but as far as any other quote unquote famous people, um, not really, just mostly the people that are are said to inhabit those locations that we've been to. Wow. Uh, have you ever gone somebody, somewhere and nothing happened? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, so it's not uh, spirits that we're communicating with. They're not actors. They're not going to come out a- every time. Right. Um, I'd say we probably um, are, if you want to call it a quote unquote success rate, um, we're probably about 70, 30. Uh, we go to a location and about 70% of the time we'll get something that we can't explain. Um, and then, you know, there's those other 30% where y- it, you just don't get anything. And that's not to say the location isn't haunted. It's just to say that, you know, for some reason that night, nothing wanted to communicate with us or make its presence known. Uh, you know, and and sometimes it's something as just one whisper or one what we call an EVP, electronic voice phenomena, um, just something as simple as that. And that to us is still amazing. Right. You're oh, in this sure. location and you're capturing a disembodied voice um, and it may only happen one time during the night. But for us, that's still incredible. That's incredible evidence. And so there there are locations that we feel are more active than others, but that's not to say that the other locations that we go to are not haunted. Sure. I remember watching um, a long time ago, there was um, one of those ghost shows and one of the guys that was a regular on there, he ended up quitting the show because there was somewhere that they went that had a a lot of demonic activity. Mm -hmm. And he felt like he brought it with him when he left, like he brought it to his own home Mm -hmm. after they were done have you ever felt like something stayed with you? After? No, no. And, and I, I say that because our, our theory on it is you have to go in with what we call the right intentions. And by that, I mean, when we go into a location, we really set our intentions with that location. We say, we're here to tell your story. Mm-hmm. We're not here to provoke you. We're not here to upset you. If you don't want to communicate with us, that is absolutely fine. Um, and, and and you're not to go home with us. You're not to leave with us. You're not to harm us in any way. We're just here to tell your story and tell the story of the location. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if you go in with that type of intention, with that intention of exploration, if you will, uh, you you kind of get that essentially respect in return, right? So nothing, we've, you know, we've never been to a location where we have felt threatened, where we have felt anything demonic, where we have felt anything malicious. Now, I will say that there are instances where things have seemed darker. And by darker, I mean, the individual or the spirit that we're attempting to communicate with us, what or uh, communicate with, right, was, somebody who wasn't so great in life. And I say that, so for example, Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary, which is located in Tennessee, um, this was a maximum security penitentiary from 1896 until 2009. And so there, there were really rough individuals housed in that penitentiary. And so there are some cells where things are darker. And by that, I mean more negative, right? If you're a jerk in life, you're, uh, you're not really going to be a, 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 you know, you're still going to be a jerk in death, right? Yeah. Um, so that that we've encountered those, and in those uh, instances, we just say, we understand that this is your cell um, or your location. We're going to leave a voice recorder here. If you want to communicate with us, great. If not, great. But we're going to go investigate another part of this building. And that's really how we handle it. So we don't go in looking for demonic. We don't go in looking for evil. Sure. We really set our intentions. And I think because of that, nothing has you know threatened us in any way. Yeah, I think it's just the unknown is why we all interpret it as evil. It's just because it's something we don't understand. And so mm-hmm. when it's you hear a noise or something happens, <laughs> it's like, oh, that's the boogeyman. It's scary. You know, mm-hmm. I had um, talked to another lady who is psychic and deals with um, helping people cross over. And okay. she said, I asked her, like, why? Like, why are why are they here? And, um, you know, how are you helping them? And she said, basically, they a lot of their deaths can be traumatic or very Mm -hmm. sudden and they don't know they're dead. And Mm -hmm. she communicates. I don't know exactly how she does it with her brain, I guess, but she communicates with them and just basically taps them on the shoulder and says, hey, you're you can go ahead and go follow the Mm -hmm. light, you know, all the typical things that you hear stereotypical things, just your family's waiting for you You can go ahead and go now, she Mm -hmm. said, but most of them just don't realize that they're gone. Mm -hmm. And and I'll echo that sentiment. Um, You know, when we go to a location, we really work on three different theories. Honestly, Uh, the first one is to that point, they don't know that they're dead. They can't find that way to cross over. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that a lot with children. If we're communicating with a child spirit, um, they, they just can't find that light because they really don't have that 
that understanding it still sure. is a spirit. Um, so I think that's why a lot of children haven't crossed over. Um, the second one is. I believe that something has to be fulfilled. There has to be, and, and we see that a lot, you know, in, in popular media that, you know, that the, you know, there's unfinished business, if you right. will. And right. I think to a point that is true, that they, that something has to be fulfilled or something has to be done in order for them to cross over peacefully. And then the third one is uh, fear of retribution for the life they lived on earth. I see, I think we see that a lot in prisons and jails. Um, you know, they're, they're afraid of because how they live their life on earth of, of what the next realm is, is going to hold for them. You know, for me, I'm a Christian, I'll call it heaven, but a lot of, you know, I think a lot of spirits in those locations just say, okay, we're, I'm comfortable staying here for right now right? Um, <laughs> I, I, because I don't want to face what's next. If there right. is a, a hell or some type of, you know, fire and brimstone on the next realm, I, I just don't want to face that right now. Yeah. Well, I could understand that. Yeah. Um, have you ever been to Savannah? I have been, yes. Because uh, that's a- supposed to be pretty haunted, isn't it? It is, yeah. So Savannah, uh, Savannah, Charleston, um, a lot of um, these old southern towns do have histories. I mean, pretty much anywhere in the country, you can find a story, you can find a oh, legend sure. or a lore. Um, you know, we actually have a, a series that we do on, on Soul Sisters Paranormal that it, it addresses landmarks, legends, and lore. So you can really go to any town or city anywhere and find reports of, of a haunting or something strange, uh, a cryptid or something like that as well. And so Savannah is is absolutely haunted. Uh, like I said, Charleston, Atlanta, all of these locations, they all have some type of story or report for sure. Oh, my cousin and I were in Savannah um, and we stayed at this. Uh, it was not a bed and breakfast, but they it was like a bed and breakfast and all the rooms were named after famous Southern women. Oh. And um, anyway, long story short, we were getting ready to go out for the night and we were in the bathroom. I had this long mirror and double sinks and we were just putting on our makeup and whatever. And in the main bedroom area, there was a super tall dresser and it had a vase. No, it was glasses. It was like champagne flutes that mm-hmm. were on the top of the dresser that they had brought to us. And when we were in the bathroom getting ready, getting our makeup on, we heard a noise and we went out and one of the champagne flutes was on the ground, not broken. And it had yeah. dropped probably it, the dresser was like maybe seven feet tall. It was a really tall dresser and wow. the windows weren't open. I mean, there was nothing. And we were just like, <laughs> how did it not break? You know, and what in the world, how did that happen? And then I didn't know until I had gotten back home from our trip that I had heard from people that Savannah was super haunted. And I was like, oh my God, it must have been a ghost. <laughs> Like, you know, then and, you're like, were they watching me sleep? What happened? <laughs> no, it very, it very well could have been. You know, like I said, Savannah has a, a very deep, rich history. And, uh, you know, probably most of those buildings there have t- some type of activity. Absolutely. That's oh. a great story. Oh, yeah. It was wild. And it really, like I said, it didn't hit me until after I got home. Thank God. Because if I would have found out <laughs> when I was there, I I am very interested and intrigued in the paranormal. But if it actually happened to me, I think every bodily function would <laughs> all at once. I'd be throwing up and peeing my pants and everything all simultaneously. Yeah. You know, sometimes they do have that way of, of kind of s- sneaking up on you or startling you for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what's this? I know you say you don't really get scared, but what's been the spookiest place you've gone to? Uh, you know, I'd say the one that had the most activity was uh, the old Gilcrest County Jail in Trenton, Florida, which is about an hour's west of Gainesville, Florida. Mm-hmm. And this is it's a very small county jail. It was built in 1928. It was in operation as a jail until 1968. And then um, when the county moved the inmates out of it, 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 they really just left it sit abandoned. And so it became this location with a lot of drug activity. Um, you know, gangs would would have uh, meetings and in, in different skirmishes inside this little building um and and so up until 2000 it really set vacant and and uh, disregarded if you will and so a new owner purchased it and she decided to allow paranormal investigators to investigate the location it, it's a very small county jail it's got four cells on the bottom and five cells on the top on the second oh. floor and then it, there's a small jailer's cottage that's connected via a doorway on the on the back so very small footprint that, that this building has and so when we went to investigate it a couple of years ago the first time i was there i was with my friend miranda from ghost biker explorations she's uh, another 
paranormal investigator, and I, I really appreciate her style of investigations. So I asked her to come with me on this investigation. And so it was just the two of us that were going to do this investigation. And we were speaking to the owner. And she knew she found out it was just going to be the two of us, two females. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, do y'all carry? i.e. do carry handguns and mm -hmm. we're like yeah yeah we're both licensed to carry and she said i highly recommend you carry your guns with you at all times during the night because this is the you know the area that we're in that this building is in and we said okay no no worries so we, we put on our pistols and we went into the building we set up all of our equipment and you know we're trying to communicate with the spirits and we really weren't getting anything right none of our equipment was alarming you know we weren't mm -hmm. picking up anything and so miranda says i wonder if they think we're law enforcement because we have our guns on us and i said well okay let, let's try it so she said let's let's take off our guns and just put them here and see what happens so i took my gun off and i put it there was a cot in the cell that we were in so i put my gun out down on the cot and miranda takes hers off her hip and she's putting it down on the cot and she says i'm putting this down nice and slowly and right behind us, a man says, good. And there's nobody oh. in the, yeah, there's nobody in the building. And so it, I mean, after that, Don, the night was on, uh, oh. you know, we, we were, we were seeing shadow figures. They were moving on command. Um, we were capturing EVPs or disembodied voices. Every piece of equipment that we had that night was indicating that some type of energy was acting on it. And this is a building that has no power. There's no electricity to it. Wow. So when you have this equipment that is designed to measure energy, and you have energy spikes being indicated on these pieces of equipment, you know, that's, that's extremely telling for us. Yes. That, that just kind of builds our case that something's going on. So I would say the old Gilcrest County jail was probably the most active location that I've been to. Um, you know, I, I can give examples of others as well, but we've just had some real, and I've been there several times, but the old Gilcrest County jail to me is probably one of the most active locations. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I couldn't imagine hearing a voice like that. Like that <laughs> is nuts. So how do you even get all your equipment? Is there, <laughs> I know you're not getting it on Amazon. Like, is there a special hey, manufacturer well, for this stuff? There, there is, but uh, you know, we do, we get some of our stuff on Amazon. Absolutely. Oh my God. Um, so a lot of the equipment that we use has been designed for other purposes and we just repurpose them as, as paranormal investigation oh. equipment. So for example, what we call EMF meters, these are small handheld meters that were uh, originally designed for electricians to find power sources in buildings. Oh, and I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a little light array on it from green to red. And um, depending on the energy that's acting upon it, it'll spike to red. So, for example, in a normal house... Um, setting one of these things by a microwave or a hairdryer that's running or mm -hmm. the refrigerator that will get it to spike to red. That's how much power it takes to, to get it to, to indicate the, a high level of energy. And so we use these, right? So we'll take them into something like the Gilcrest County jail where there's, there's no power. And theoretically, if you have them sitting on the floor or wherever, if there's no power in the building, no energy into the building, they should never spike, right? They sure. should always be on green. So when you're sitting there in a dark room and you know, there's no electricity and you start asking questions such as, you know, are you here with us? If you are, can you touch the light in front of me? And it's, and it spikes, that's pretty telling. Right. And if, you, if you can get that on multiple pieces of equipment or in multiple instances, that really kind of builds our case that something interesting is going on, something that we can't explain is going on. Huh. That is so cool. <laughs> uh, do you have like a dream place out of the country that you'd like to investigate? Have you ever thought about leaving the country? Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I've been, I, I've traveled internationally to uh, on several occasions, um, and I would love to get back to Ireland and investigate Leap Castle in Ireland. That is my, you know, number one bucket list location. Oh. Uh, it, it's supposed to be extremely haunted. A lot of stories, um, and and Europe itself is just interesting because of the longevity. You know, right. we we have our history here, and and I love American history. You know, everything about American history to me is just fascinating, but. Obviously, it doesn't have the longevity that someplace like England does or Ireland or, you know, some places in France. They just have a different history. So to go to those locations to me would be phenomenal. Um, uh, there's also a place in uh, Australia called the Monte Cristo Plantation. And uh, that's just a, a few hours outside of Sydney. And I would love to get to that location as well. I've been, I've been as a tourist, but not as a paranormal investigator. 
how do the how do you get the rights to be able to do that? Do you have to contact? You have to ask somebody. Like, can mm-hmm. we come and stay the night and and get? Do you have to pay money or have a permit or how does it work? Uh, a little bit of both. So oh. um, we we've, we've because you know um, Soul Sisters Paranormal the the locations that we've gone to and and kind of our our mannerism of our investigation. We have people contact us that say, hey, you know, do you want to come and investigate this location? Uh, you know, can you can you do that for us? And absolutely, we'll, we'll go to those locations. We also contact owners of places that are reported to be haunted or a historical building that we're fascinated with. And we just contact them and say, you know, can will you allow us to investigate this? This is who we are. This yeah. is what we do. Here's, uh, you know, kind of our style. We give them the website. Will you allow us to investigate your location? And and for the most part, it, we've had a great response rate to that. And though, so then we'll we'll put together a documentary and kind of highlight what we did at the location. Um, and then others, you know, you do have to get a permit to to investigate. You know, we don't do any trespassing or mm-hmm. anything illegal like that. You know, we we do respect the location. Sure. Um, but for the most part, it's either us being asked or we ask a location owner. So, and you said it's you and your sister, I mean, and, and other people too, but related to you, it's just you and your sister. My two sisters. Yeah. So, oh, two um, sisters. Okay. yeah, so I, I have a twin sister and a younger sister. Okay. So we really started Soul Sisters Paranormal. Um, and then we have two family friends that join us on occasion. Now, s- for the last year and a half, really because of, of COVID and a couple of other, you know, family or, uh, uh, f- uh, you know, family things, i.e. Kim had a granddaughter and Cara mm-hmm. moved. So, logistically um it's really just jenny and myself my twin sister right now okay. um, and the others will join us as they can um when we first started all of the locations that we went to it was the five of us and then it kind of had to taper off a little bit really because of logistics and work and family and all of that yeah you can't can't do that on zoom <laughs> <laughs> no you can't well did your um parents or family were they freaking out when they knew that you guys were going to start going into these haunted places N- not really you know my family is extremely close uh you know my parents i talk to my parents every day uh you yeah. know i talk to my sisters every day so we we come from a very close family and the that. one thing i the one thing i appreciate about, about my parents is uh you know they allowed us to formulate our own beliefs about an afterlife about religion like i said we we are christian so that's just kind of mm-hmm. how we we chose to believe um so they always really encouraged that sense of going out and finding answers for yourself. Um, And and that's really why we come from that research background, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so when we first started telling them that we were doing this, my dad, especially, he was more of the skeptic. He's like, okay, you know, just, just have fun, be safe, call call us when you're done. (laughs) And, um, you know, that sort of thing. And so for the, the first couple of investigations, he's like, oh, that's cool. You know, what did it look like inside? And then he started telling my uncles um, who were close with as well, and his brothers. And so they started asking, well, what was it like? What, what did you feel? What did you see? And all, all this other stuff. So that's really why I started the videos that I did, because my family were really inquisitive as to what the actual experience was of being in the location. So I started really putting the videos together to show them and I put them on YouTube and uh, it really started taking off after that. So my, my family has become, you know, not become, they've always been encouraging about what we've done. um, But they've become our biggest fans. I mean, you know, my, my dad's my, yeah, my dad sports a soul sister shirt. And (laughs) so, you know, you can't ask for a better fan than that. And so they've always been very encouraging. And every time, you know, I, I put out a video or we've out a video um you know they share it all over the place they're they're really proud of what we've done with this because it is different but my dad you know like i said he's a skeptic but every time we show him something a light anomaly or uh, an evp that we've captured it's just um to him it's just fascinating so that that's a really uh that's a really cool feeling for me yeah because you can't deny the evidence and for some reason a lot of maybe it's not i shouldn't say men are skeptics it just maybe just dads are skeptics (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> my dad was always the same way just oh that's a bunch of bs that's not real you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um so I, if this is a dumb question i'm going to edit it out <laughs> <laughs> is, is this your job 
do you get paid for this or do you have like a, so this is a side hustle fun thing that you do? It, well, it started out as a side hustle fun thing that we do. Uh, you know, Soul Sisters Paranormal as a group, we're all self-funded. Um, everything that we do, you know, the travel expenses, yeah. the, if there's a cost to get into a location, we fund all of that. Um, you know, we do sell t-shirts and stuff, but that's minimal. That's really just to, to advertise more than sure. anything else. So it is self-funded. Um, but for me personally, um, a, a year ago, I was really in a position to kind of make a, a career transition in my life. So my, my, my business partner, Miranda, uh, from Ghost Biker Explorations, um, just through, through a series of events, um, we were led to the historic Scott County Jail in Huntsville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So M Miranda is from that location originally. And you know, her dad, unfortunately, passed about two years ago. And she needed to move back to the area to really help her mom. Oh. And so because of that, she said, you know, she contacted me and said, listen, there's this this jail. It's been sitting vacant since 2008. Would you want to become my business partner? And let's see if we can put in a museum in this in this building, as well as a paranormal research center. So we contacted the town of Huntsville and we told them what we wanted to do. And they were extremely receptive. So they allowed us to open the museum. We, we have, uh, you know, paranormal investigators that investigated. So through a series of events, this is now my life. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm completely immersed in Scott County, Tennessee history, as well as the paranormal in this building in Huntsville. So to answer your question, yes, this is, this is my life now. That's uh -huh. amazing though, that it all fold, you know, folded out that way. And of course, Huntsville wants the revenue and to have the mm -hmm. tourists come. So yeah, exactly. It's smart for them too, but that's awesome. I'm so mm -hmm. happy for you. Like well, thank you. you're getting to do what you love and that's, you can't ask for anything better than that. Mm -hmm. it, it is a lot of fun. You know, it, it's very challenging. I, I've never been a museum owner in my life. So there's a lot of things <laughs> that we're learning along the way. But it is fun to knowing that we're helping to preserve this location. And on a daily basis, you know, we'll hear footsteps. We'll hear doors slamming. You know, pictures will come flying off the wall. Oh and to, my be, God. to be immersed in that is, is pretty cool for us. Yeah. And it's just like normal for you. Like you're just like, yeah, that's just what happens. <laughs> And then exactly. You also be like, what in the world? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, shadow figure just on the third floor. Yeah, <laughs> oh. no problem. That's just a normal day for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I have enjoyed talking to you so much. I want you to promote yourself, which is so that people know where you're at and you know if they want to look at your website and all that good mm -hmm. stuff. So go ahead and promote yourself. Okay. Well, um, the name of my group is Soul Sisters Paranormal, and the website is www.soulsistersparanormal.com. Um, anything you want to know about us is there. All of our videos are there. Um, we're also very active on Facebook as well as on YouTube, both under Soul Sisters Paranormal. And then for the Historic Scott County Jail, the website is www.historicscottcojail.com. Um, we're also very active on Facebook under Historic Scott County Jail. So you can come to the jail, you can take a tour, flashlight tour, after dark tour, or oh, use it wow. as a paranormal investigation location. Uh, it, it is a very cool little building. So the historic Scott County Jail in Huntsville, Tennessee is where that's located. Uh -huh. You're just popular Patty too. I saw you, you were on a lot of podcasts. I'm like, oh my God, she's like a professional. I need to up my game here. Be prepared. Oh, well, you know, I, I've really enjoyed this. You know, I, I you know, I, I really like conversations that are just, uh, you know, kind of off the cuff, kind of like right. you're speaking to a friend. So that's yeah. what this podcast has been. So thank you. Oh, my gosh, that that makes me feel so good, because that's exactly what I want. I just want people to come on, just talk about what they love and just get to know more people. And this <laughs> has just been such a fun avenue to do that. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being on. And uh, we'll talk soon. Absolutely, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.